Good morning. I trust that uh, you have had a good week as we uh, come together on what uh, is, I think, a very, um, what word would I use? Very important, important Sunday for us, uh, not just, uh, or more so than, than one might uh, you'll be thinking about, well, it's in the Easter season, but I don't know if you are aware that this, this is the first time that those communion candles have, have been lit uh, outside of a festival service since last March. Not this March, but last March, as we uh, prepare to come to the Lord's table within the context of uh, this morning's service. And in that regard, I'm going to ask chairman of our Board of Elders to step forward uh, for just a moment to make sure that you understand how this is going to work. Yes. Oh God. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> how we're going to do this, we'll bring people this size of our community first and you'll come out to the aisle. There's markers on the aisle so you just stay that six feet apart. Uh, when it's your turn, we'll step forward as family or individual. And receive the bread from the pastor on this side of the sanctuary. And then you'll move to the other side of the sanctuary where you'll receive the wine from the elder that is serving. That'll be Larry, I think, today. And um, then you will proceed out. On this side, you'll have to go all the way around and come back in on this side of your, on the other side of the pew. This side, you'll come out the same way. This side, then that side. Leave your uh, disposables in the little baskets here on the table. You know, the cup and the little wrapper for your bread. Leave that on the table there. Uh, so this side of the room has to come out this way and then just go back to this side. Simple. Simple. Pretty easy. We just try to keep those masks on until you actually get to the food and you can remove them, of course, and then uh, put them back to the back to your to your table, to your chair, or two. Okay. All right. Praise God. <clears throat> Thank you, Bob. So, as I said, a very, uh, um, very poignant Sunday for us here at uh, at Cross of Christ, and uh, we see that theme: abide in Christ. Uh, you hear that word uh, in Jesus. Um, in the gospel lesson today in which Jesus is talking about uh, being the true vine and how that, uh, uh, how that relates to us. So, we'll, by God's grace, uh, move forward now into uh, the opening hymn, Now All the Vault of Heaven Resounds.
And so we turn to these words that remind us again, uh, someone has said, whose we are and who we are. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so let us come before God, to whom all hearts are open and from whom no secrets are hid, as we confess our sins in the name of him who died and rose again to give us forgiveness and life. I invite you to take uh, a moment now as you either remain standing or as you kneel uh, to consider the events of these past days. Now remembering our failings and our failures, our sins, our trespasses, our transgressions, we pray together. I confess that I have lived as if God did not matter and as if I mattered most. My Lord's name I have not honored as I should. My worship and prayer life have faltered. I have not let his love have its way with me, and so my love for others has failed. There are many whom I have hurt and many whom I have failed to help. My thoughts and desires are soiled with sin. I have sinned against God and against you, my brothers and sisters. There is no health in me. Except for the promise of Christ, I could not hope for reconciliation and peace. O oh Lord, forgive me, renew me, and lead me, so that I may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Now receive the forgiveness won for you by his passion, death, and resurrection. By the command of our Lord Jesus Christ as a called and ordained servant of the word. I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. So let us pray. O oh God, you make the minds of your faithful to be of one will. Therefore grant to your people that they may love what you command and desire what you promise. That among the manifold changes of this age, our hearts may ever be fixed where true joys are to be found. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. May be seated as we hear the lessons appointed for this day. The first reading comes from Acts chapter 8, verse 26 through 40. An angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning seated in his chariot. And he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, Go over and join this chariot. 
So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this, like a sheep he was led to the slaughter and like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth and began, beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop. And they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, as, and as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle lesson comes from 1 John chapter 4, beginning at the first verse. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many pro false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this the love of God has met, has, was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise out of respect for our Lord and his words to us as we find ourselves in the 15th chapter of John's account. We hear again Jesus speaking, uh, talking about uh, what some have called I am statements. From the first verse, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch of mine that does not bear fruit he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you will, and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, 
and so prove to be my disciples. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. These words that we just sang, they tie in so beautifully with our gospel reading. Jesus, the vine, we are the branches. Last verse, sing with creation to God the I am. And especially that line at the end, give God the glory. Hallelujah. And so I'd like to take you to the opening two verses of John chapter 15. Listen again to what Jesus says. I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit he prunes that it may bear more fruit. And then again in verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, 
He it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. As I was thinking about the, uh, what theme to put for the, um, the sermon, I initially uh, had it a little bit longer than what you see in your bulletin, Bearing Fruit in Abundance. Uh, I'd originally written down, Bearing Much Fruit to the Glory of God. And I just shortened it. But I want to go back to that idea because I think it picks up for us uh, something that is significant. Uh, and it certainly brings to mind uh, a great Lutheran composer. Someone that most people who know anything about music know. A man named Johann Sebastian Bach. Born 335 years ago, this past month, in a little town in Germany that uh, was dear to Luther also because uh, he spent much of the enjoyable years of his childhood there. As I said, probably you know that Bach went on to become one of the most influential musical geniuses of all time. He set uh, uh, how would you say it? Um, a level of, uh, of significance and of beauty and artistry in his music that has uh, perhaps never been equaled. And he's always remembered for those musicologists for something that he put at the end of every one of his 300 plus cantatas, his, his great uh, um, works, his hymns, uh, and others. And I guess maybe in a sense he's sort of a trendsetter for our day. Because what he put at the end of all of those compositions is SDG. You know, we live in a time where we have all these acronyms. Some of them from old, right? A-M-P-M. Yeah. B.C., A.D., and now all of these that show up everywhere, L.O.L., and B.F.F., and all the rest, right? Uh, uh, in that sense, um, Bach died 270 years ago, 270 years ahead of his time, because what he said was S.D.G. You have to remember that he put it in Latin, Soli Deo Gloria. To God alone be glory. And, and that was important to him. He, he always remembered the source of his gift. He always acknowledged its, its purpose. It wasn't about him. It was about giving glory to God. That was his conviction throughout his life. Music dedicated to the glory of God. And for this we praise and glorify our Heavenly Father for giving such gifts to people. Not just Him, but so many down through the years. Enriching our lives. Touching us in very significant ways because music has that ability. But to return to this uh, morning's theme, uh, today's text another of John's recordings of Jesus' I am statements. There's seven of them, by the way. I am the vine, you are the branches, Jesus said. Ended it at the end of that, uh, those verses that I read to you. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So let me ask you the question, how many of us really understand and accept those words. How many of us truly believe that without the Lord we could accomplish nothing? Or is it more like what Jesus is talking about and John in his letter is talking about the world's view? 
our, our own sinful nature whispering in our ears that the opposite is actually true. You're doing just fine on your own. What you've accomplished so far in your life is your own doing and you should be proud of that. On your own, by yourself. And with lies like that, many are deluded into thinking that they don't even owe God a passing acknowledgement. And we are moving more and more and more in that direction in this country and across the globe. We don't even owe God a passing acknowledgement, much less daily thanks and praise for his continuing blessing. What does the psalmist tell us? What does he remind us of in those words? All the earth is the Lord's. And in case you think what you've done is your ability and your skill and your intellect, what do you think Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians 6? You are not your own. You didn't bring yourself into existence. You don't maintain yourself by some strength of your own power. The fact is, dear children of God, that without our Lord's ongoing presence in your life and mine, we couldn't even draw the next breath. That breath that, remember, comes from Him. That miracle that has brought each of us uniquely into being within our moms. That breath that carries us all the way back historically, chronologically to a man and a woman in a garden, in a perfect world. And he formed Adam, and he formed Eve. But they were without life, right? And he breathed into them the breath of life, the ruach. That Hebrew word that talks about God's own breath. God's own spirit. God's power to live and exist. Scripture reminds us as far, as far as this ongoing nature. Remember these words? All things are upheld by the word of his power. Do you stop to think about that ever? All things are upheld by the word of his power. What I hear that saying is that if Almighty God were to remove his sustaining and preserving power, not only you and I, but the entire universe as, as we know it, would vanish. Vanish in an instant. I am the vine. You are the branches. In this rather prolonged metaphor, Jesus is using well-known facts of great horticulture to present some important truths about discipleship. As far as we know, Jesus was never involved in raising grapes. As far as we know, none of his disciples ever were. Right? We know four of them were fishermen. We know one of them was a tax collector. We know a few details. And, and maybe one of them was involved in the raising of grapes. But to, he uses that on the evening in which he is going to share with them in bread and wine his own body and blood. Because these words are spoken in the upper room on that day that you and I know as Monday Thursday. 
what he's saying is that just as each branch of a grapevine draws its life from the main vine, so all people are sustained by God. And furthermore, you may know that in grape growing, not every branch, maybe you have some grape vines that you check on periodically and, and look at. But to know that not every branch produces grapes in abundance and needs to be cut back for the good of the vine's potential because grapes grow on new growth. They don't grow on the woody stock down near the roots, but out in that new bright green growth. Whether you're in Germany, whether you're in Italy, whether you're in California, whether you're in New York, wherever. That's true, that's basic to, to vine tending. And Jesus says his father is the vine dresser, the one who tends to the vines. And yes, he does bring that word of, of caution at the end where he talks about those who don't abide in him, those that do not bear any fruit, gathered up, burned. That's word of law that reminds us that there is a day of reckoning coming. And Jesus speaks of that in various ways. This is one of them. And the one, of course, that we know very well from Matthew 25 is he talks about those on his right hand and those on his left hand. And the difference that will be made on that day when, as we will say again in the creed in a little bit, he will come to judge the living and the dead. But do you notice what he says about those good branches that bear fruit, that they, even they, need to be pruned. And that pruning is an ouch, is it not? A reminder to us that the Lord is at work in those times of trials and testing. That he has a purpose. Is he keeps us close. Keeps us close to him. As we work through with his help. With his love. Through those adversities. He is the vine. We are the branches. That's what our, our text underscores. He's the one who gives us the ability to bear fruit. And that bearing fruit, as you know, is what gives purpose to our life. Not to live for ourselves. That's why John talks so much about loving as our Savior does. Reaching out to touch the lives of others. Bearing fruit is what the Christian's life is all about. And if I can change the image slightly, you know, there are folks out there who are very happy to bear blossoms that never go anywhere. They look good to others. They're admired. But there is no fruit. It's just a show. You and I call to productive life, not non-productive. That's what life is all about. There was a, a fascinating experiment that took place at Amherst College back some years ago in which a, a pumpkin seed 
was planted in a rather large area of good soil. And when the vine had produced uh, a pumpkin about the size of my fist, the researchers put a band of steel around it. And they attached some sort of, of uh, equipment, and I'd have to ask one of the engineers here in the congregation uh, how you'd go about doing that. But they, but they did it. But they sought to, to determine the, the growth power, the expansion power of that little pumpkin seed that they had originally planted that's now this beautiful vine and, and this pumpkin. And, and they uh, estimated that it would have the power of a, the ability to press outward with about 500 pounds of pressure. So you can imagine how surprised they were that in two months that that little, that pumpkin that was banded with that steel was pushing 1,500 pounds, then 2,000 pounds. And finally, they had to put new bands on it. And they kept watching, and the pressure reached 5,000 pounds of pressure against the steel bands and broke them. And they opened up that squash, that pumpkin, and it wasn't like a normal one. It was full of this heavy-duty fiber that was fighting against those restraints with all of its strength. And then they decided to check something out. They dug up the vine. And that particular vine had extended its roots out over 80,000 square feet. You know how big that is? 80,000 square feet in which it was drawing substance, in which it was bringing that which was necessary to deal with that pressure. I would hate to think that you and I have less determination than a pumpkin in withstanding the pressures that come. Yeah, there are plenty of them in this day and time. And maybe more so than, than past generations. We have been given minds and bodies and abilities and dreams to struggle against the world, against those powers of darkness, to produce those fruits worthy of branches that are connected to that living vine that is rooted in God's presence, in our Savior's saving work. Brothers and sisters, we search in vain when we look elsewhere than God for the strength and sustenance we so desperately need in these troubling times in which we live. One last quick picture. I recall a cartoon I saw once that showed a man standing at a bar. And you could see on his face he was, it was very serious. He was in a very somber mood. And he was saying to the bartender, little, little deal at the bottom, you know, I came in here to drown my troubles, but I think they're learning to swim. How true, how true, right? There are those who will seek what they need from alcohol or from drugs, avoiding the difficulties of life, sitting zombie-eyed in front of a game screen, looking to just other folks who will tell them what they think they need to hear, or maybe philosophy, or maybe some bizarre personal indulgence. But I'm here to tell you that all other avenues 
then that one marked Christ is a dead end street. A dead end street. This one who says to us, I am the true vine. Abide in me. The one who stands ready today in this service to give us his body and blood and bread and wine. To remind us again and no matter what the circumstances, no matter what our situation, those words that he said as he went back to heaven are as true today as they were back those many centuries. I am with you always. I am with you. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the good shepherd. One who cares for sheep. Who watches over us. And provides for us. And loves us. With a power that is. Can never be measured. Except in a cross. With the nails through his hands. And a spear in his side. Amen. And so in his name we come. As we're reminded of that. That peace and that love. And that presence that is ours. Throughout all our days. Amen. made reference to these words. Would you join me? Please rise. They speak to us of this Father, Son, and Holy Spirit who loves us so very much. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. we prepare to come before our Lord and lift up our prayers and our praises and needs of, of various people. 
you've looked in your bulletin, you see that there are families that are grieving. As we lift up the family and friends of Mallory Hoff, his 28-year-old daughter of Rhonda Duncan's best friend. Family and friends of Roberto Gonzalez, a co-worker of Dave Murray. Family and friends of Virginia Ralston, this aunt of Jamie Mofsky. Family and friends of David Chadwick, Don Lee's cousin over in England. And to those, I would add, two other families. Uh, family and friends of Jay Ferret. Remember that this was a, a co-worker of Matt Renux as uh, uh, he died this past week. And then also a good friend of folks over at BCA here in town, um, a former care staff person who, who um, saw to it that children after school uh, were, uh, were cared for. Uh, so the family and friends of Ray Steinmetz, uh, who died very suddenly. And, and I know that you have others, uh, acquaintances, uh, neighbors, family, friends. Um, as we lift them up under those same circumstances. But you also see others that are in need of God's ongoing uh, strength and healing and care. Uh, Jamie Jones, this... Uh, very good friend of my daughter Rebecca, uh, as uh, this baby has come so very early, and, and both of them are still in the hospital. Please uh, remember her and her daughter. Uh, Eric Land, uh, Zach's father, as uh, he was hospitalized with double pneumonia. He is now out uh, as of a couple of days ago, and so we praise the Lord for that. Uh, you see, uh, Shelley's uh, friend Adam Handley, as is sometimes the case with folks that have had COVID, that those complications continue on. Um, Kathy Brackenhoff, Byron's sister-in-law, uh, now uh, told of uh, continued spread of the tumors. Judy Delaney, uh, Joni Renhack's neighbor, uh, injured in, in a fall. And, and you know that we have been having um, uh, Reverend Jim Bannock, who's the, whom, whom I know, uh, PAL's director for this, uh, these past uh, several years, has been in the hospital there in St. Louis for some weeks, and he's finally home. But uh, the word that came out is that he is, what's the expression, weak as a kitten. Uh, whatever that means. Um, we also have several others to remember. Irma Pinkerton, um, such a, uh, a faithful member in our church. Uh, she is not doing well at all. Um, word from her daughter-in-law is that uh, cancer has returned with a vengeance. So please keep Irma in your prayers. Also, Faith Evans, uh, it's a daughter of Lily Thorson. She's scheduled for knee, knee replacement uh, this coming Thursday. And, and Mike's mom uh, talked with, Mike Witherby uh, talked with him before the service. His mom has been uh, placed in the hospital with uh, pneumonia uh, complications. You see others that we continue to lift up, Tammy Alexander and Pat Bashanis and, and Bernie Brackenhoff and Tracy Smith and Helen Veldman. And uh, we give thanks that Beverly Gilbert is, um, you know, has, uh, has been moved back into Morning Point up in Hickson. Uh, and as I said, I know that there are others of you that you would lift up. And so we have this opportunity now to remember them in prayer. I would invite you to kneel or to stand as we turn to the prayer of the church. Keep us, O Lord, as branches on your vine. 
that we may not lose faith, but live to proclaim your glory and produce the fruit which you desire. Bless your church with courage and conviction. Be with all pastors and leaders of the church. Bring to completion all that we begin in your name. Let your love shine through us to the world around us that others may come to know your son by our witness. Give power to our words of witness and transform us so that our deeds may testify to your love in Christ. Be with those we've already named today and these that we bring to you in the silence of our hearts and minds. We bring them to you, each of them and all of them, needing your special healing and care. Help us to be instruments of comfort to the hurting, agents of hope to the despairing, and messengers of love to the lonely. And guide us to those who are in special need that we may show your love to them. Now remembering the saints, who proclaim the risen Lord, give us your spirit that we too may be found faithful. Receive our thanks for those who passed on the faith to us and help us to pass on the faith to those yet to come. Accept our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving and teach us the joy of giving. Having been freed by Christ from the power of sin and death, we gladly and willingly offer ourselves and all that we have to your service. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all our prayers and everyone for whom we have prayed, even our very selves. Hear and answer us according to the mercy we have received through Jesus our Lord. Amen. And we join in our family prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We pray. Oh, blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of all creation. You've had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. We give you thanks now for the redemption you have prepared for us through Christ. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of his cross and receive the blessings of your forgiveness and life and salvation that comes to us in his body and blood. And so as we remember our Lord Jesus, who on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. And then in the same way, 
He also took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so we come, O oh Lord, to receive your blessing and the wonder of your presence and the power that you have brought to us through bread and wine. In Jesus' name, amen. And now may the peace of the Lord be with you always. Come, for all is now ready.
O vine of life, we give you thanks for having fed us your branches with a life that enables us to bear witness to you and bear fruit which befits your glory. Guard and keep us that we may not fall away from you, the vine, but remain in your love and in the power of your life. O Lord Jesus Christ, who with the Father and the Spirit are ever one and everlasting. Amen. And now may the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you, each and all. Amen. Maybe seated. What a joyous day to again be receiving our, our Lord's body and blood here in the service with all our brothers and sisters as we look forward to, uh, to things returning uh, to normal and in our lives. Um, moving onward into whatever that new normal is. Um, quick reminder about some things uh, coming further down the road. Uh, Sunday school and um, junior Bible class set to start up uh, at the beginning of June. And so uh, we look forward to that. You see uh, items of um, the schedule. Uh, you see a thank you also um, on behalf of the Synod as uh, uh, that money for the Here I Stand gathering has been, uh, uh, has been sent on to St. Louis. Uh, I don't know of anything else to especially call attention to. Uh, we will uh, be picking up with Bible class in about, uh, uh, well, at, uh, at 10.30, so in about uh, a little over 10 minutes. Uh, again, great to have all of you here. Uh, to be able to look out and see uh, familiar faces. Uh, and at least for the time being, uh, you know, uh, maybe your favorite spot in the church is one of those that's been marked off. But, uh, but we look forward to the time when, uh, you know, because everybody has their favorite spots, right? And uh, we'll, uh, uh, we'll find that happening here before too long. May God go with you and may you be a blessing to the folks around you this week.